Okay, let's see. Yeah, the microphone's working. That's a cool thing. And if my presenter's also working, at least the technology part is fine. So, welcome to that talk. And with that nice title, DevOps is not enough, which is a little bit of clickbait, of course. And yeah, I, I did the talk several times. The longest version of the talk I did was more than one and a half hours, and the shortest one was about 40 minutes. I'm still not sure if the people really have recovered yet from that, drinking from the fire hose. And so we have about 45 to 50 minutes, so good luck, everyone. <laughs> still, but the good part of the message is you get a completely updated version of that talk. So the core ideas are still the same, but Time moves on, technology, knowledge moves on, so you get a lot more of new details that weren't in the old version. And I also got rid of a bit of stuff so that this 45 minutes might work. This is the most boring part of the presentation, actually. The only thing that might be interesting for you is um, speaker deck where you can download all the slides, but I will also share the link on the Slack instance here then after I've uploaded them. And you, if you have any more questions um, later on, uh, which you didn't ask right now, or you figure it out next week or something, just drop me a message on Twitter or send me an email, say, yeah, well, heard your talk over there at DevTurnity and here's something I haven't got. So my email address is not on there, but first name dot last name dot company name dot de. So I'm from Germany yet, so it's quite straightforward. Uwe dot Friedrichsen at Concentric DE. But that's it, basically. So let's get started. And talking about DevOps. DevOps is a good source of eternal confusion. So let's start with the question, what is DevOps? Yeah. DevOps, and I've talked with a lot of people about DevOps, and I've got a lot of opinions about what DevOps is. And I always go like, wow, yeah, hmm. So about automating build and deployment? No, that's continuous delivery, sorry. And new term of agile? No, different drivers, different goals. And yeah, it's about more tooling. No, it's not. And you build it, you run it. Uh, Managers love that, so yeah, we, we got you developer right here, and now we've got you at your whatever piece of your body and so on. And that, no, you confuse cause and effect somehow. So if you really do DevOps right, this might be a consequence, but it doesn't start here, definitely not. And you need Kubernetes of Dev for DevOps, of course. No, you can't do it. Do, uh, DevOps. And it's about, it's my favorite ones, mediating between devs and ops. No, please not. Definitely not. And it's a mindset saying, yeah, well, isn't that always true? So, yeah, welcome to the perfect confusion. And for the next 45 minutes or so, let's stick to the definition of the Phoenix project, the original meaning of DevOps, which is basically the three ways of DevOps. In a nutshell, so DevOps in about two or three minutes. The first way is the most important one is system thinking. So you have an IT value chain. Somebody has an idea from the business department most likely or wherever it comes from. And you have to bring it down out to the, down to the customer who can give you big feedback on that idea. And you try to holistically optimize that. So you're not trying to optimize requirements or testing or something. But the time that it takes to bring that idea out to the customer through the whole IT value chain from the beginning to the end. That's what the core of DevOps is, optimization, systemic or holistic optimization. And the second way supports you here. It's about amplifying feedback loops. Most people only think about um, ops giving feedback to dev, which is only part of this. It's all part of feedback loops. Because usually, if you've got any defects downstream in your value chain, usually they come, they're rooted in something which went wrong further upstream. So some knowledge was missing there. And yeah, we, we know that from um, ops giving feedback to dev. Yeah, what you just developed here, yeah, it 
might have looked cool on your development IDE, but down here in production it's got this effect and which isn't so cool, so it breaks all the time or whatever. And so let's talk about, I give you feedback, it doesn't work, so let's sit together and learn how to do that better upstream, so in development. Or even customers giving feedback to business. So all kinds of feedback loops because defects make us slow on the IT value chain, so we need the feedback. And the third thing, continuous, le um, continuous learning. So first of all, for doing things good, you need some kind of mastery, and mastery is based on training. So you need to have the time for training. And on the other hand, um, entropy never sleeps. So if you don't try to improve to get things better, they will get worse over time. So you have to have some means in place to figure out better ways of doing things. And this is not a heroic big approach, so here we're doing it once in, a, uh, so once in a lifetime and then never again. So I'm coming from Germany and we are perfect in this 110% or nothing, which most of the time leaves us with nothing. And um, so, but, and not, also not um, whenever we will find time, because you will never find time for that. But continuously, small ideas, small experiments. That's the DevOps I'm talking about here for the next 40 minutes or something like that. But I said, it's not enough or just the beginning. What do I mean with that? And to explain that, I have to introduce two things, basically, a bit of background, two things, evolution of markets, evolution of IT, because we have to understand where we are to understand why we need it. Let's start with the evolution of markets. And there are several models for that. I, I like to take this bathtub curve to explain that. Uh, it's not so important what's on here. I give it piece by piece. It starts in the pre-industrial era. So whenever you wanted to have something, some good in the pre-industrial era, you went to the craftsmen. Yeah, back then, unfortunately, there were only craftsmen. Uh, meanwhile, we moved a little bit further. Um, so we have people, and, uh, but back then, only crowd, and I said, yeah, well, um, I want to have this and that, you discussed a little bit, and then if you got things right, then Graf, that guy said, to, said uh, to you, yeah, well, come back in a minute, uh, come down in a minute, and in a week or something like that, and you came back then in a week, and you exactly got what you wanted, and it was cool, and the key for success from the point of view of the supplier was that he really knew how to do his job which is okay, but, but it has two problems. The first problem is, it was very expensive. Very few people were able to afford this. And the second thing is, it didn't scale so well. So, I wanna have one table, it's okay. I wanna have 100, whoa, hold the horses. That's a different story, but we, we all know this problem has been solved, industrial markets. So. Standardizing the product a little bit, um, the famous quote from Henry Ford, you can order your Ford T in any color you like, as long as the color is black. So, yeah, standardize things and then pre-design the production process, split it into parts, so division of labor approach, connect the different stations with an assembly line, and then you've got the product. So, Frederick Winslow, Taylor, Henry Ford, and so on, all these people created that. And by doing that, you didn't need to have a craftsperson in charge for the whole thing, but just for pieces of that. So all, all the people just needed to know their stage. And so you were able to produce things a lot cheaper, less expensive. And this has a dramatic effect because if you're able to lower the price by 50% in a non-saturated market, you can address about 10 to 50 times of the customers. So you sell a lot more. And this again has a dramatic effect because demand is a lot higher than supply in such a situation. And this is the prerequisite, the basic idea, the underlying idea of all industrial production. Demand is higher than supply, which makes sales certain. So, you produce something, and because there's such a high demand, it 
it's guaranteed to be sold. And key to success for you then is just to turn away from the market because if you're not screwing it up completely, they will buy anyway and optimize internally, which is then how to scale your production in a cost-efficient way because then it's guaranteed to be sold. Certainty, which is a cool thing. Unfortunately, things changed eventually. So it was a good paradigm for, for quite a long time. But then at the end of the late se last century, um, things changed a little bit. So from domain to domain, and which changed so by globalization, internet business, and some other influences factor. This ratio between the demand and supply tilted eventually in the domain. So there were more and more suppliers or competitors fighting for the customers. And so eventually supply was a much a lot higher than demand. And this again has a dramatic effect because right now people are no longer buying just because you're producing. Your customers get, well, let's call it picky. They buy wherever their actual needs are satisfied best. So it's uncertainty. It's, so you produce something you do, know, you do not know anymore if anybody's going to buy that. You only know that after you get feedback from the market. So from your customers and see that, well, they liked it. Oh, no, they didn't like it. Oh, well, they're even annoyed by that and all these things. And in the, such a kind of situation, your key to success is always to hear for the ever-changing demands of the market because the best competitors, the best producers who are listening best to the, uh, to the market and create those kind of products which match the needs and the demands of the customers will create a high, a very fast and um, highly dynamic market which always creates a new baseline for expectations. And so you always have to, am I still right, am I still right? So lots of feedback needed, which is a completely different situation. So wrapping up that story is, so pre-industrial era, we have no idea uh, what the driver is basically, so just get the, pay, uh, the bill paid basically. And industrial era, it's about cost efficiency and scale, while post-industrial is about uh, cycle times, how fast can you get feedback from the market and adapt adapt adaptability. So always to adapt to changing needs. Very different market, very different situation for companies. Okay, well, number one. Number two, evolution of IT. If we take time here and the business support of IT on the other axis, we get a line like that. It starts in the late 50s when transistors became available, before that was tubes or even mechanic computers, fixing the computers took more time than actually calculating on the machines and wasn't, doesn't, didn't make a lot of sense for commercial computing but then it started back then and yeah it was quite cool. Still machines didn't have a lot of computing power so even a mid-sized smartphone from two or three years ago has about several thousand times the computing power of these machines. So things that you were able to make with that are some, here's a little report, there's a small analysis, things like that, very small specific things. But business departments loved that. I mean, pocket computers became widely, uh, so pocket calculators became widely available in the mid 70s or 80s or something like that. So I still remember my father bringing one back home somewhere in the 70s. Wow, that's a cool thing. I mean, before that, it was everything pen and paper and maybe a slide ruler for multiplication. Have you ever created a report this way? It sucks like hell. And so they loved these computers. They wanted to have more software, more, more, more of that, which created basically the software crisis. So we want more software because Software development was still in the pre-industrial era. Some craftspeople, there were a lot of women, by the way, who were doing that, and, um, but not enough of them. So if you can get hold of one of them, it's nice, but if not, well, bad luck. And so we have to scale production of software in a cost-efficient way. Hey, wait, we had that before. So let's let to software engineering. Let's split up our software development process in division of labor fashion. So 
business analysis requirements in engineering, architecture, design, implementation, testing, assembly, deployment, and also for the production part, maybe split it up a little bit and have this virtual assembly line in between, which we call the software development process, which ties it all together, how to hand over from station to station, it, which was okay for a while. It never was perfect, well, it was okay, but IT moved on and so, PCs came along, personal computers, networking came along, and we were able to address more, not only some business functions, but more like parts of business processes. And now we really go into the domain which is dominated by humans, and this is naturally no longer a complicated, but a complex problem, so from system theory, and which is a little bit different. We will talk about that in a minute. And yeah, but it move, uh, moves on then. Moore's Law did its job, so we got the internet, we got mobile, um, which most companies still haven't understood what it actually means. And um, today, basically, um, we're, IT is more like less the business nervous system of any non-trivial company. So the whole, DNA of your business is coded into your IT systems, which does not only mean that you must be able to run your IT systems all the time, but it also means that you cannot change a single product, a single feature, a single process, anything without touching IT anymore, which has some consequences. So, IT has changed a lot over these years, decades. Still, if we look at the picture, quite often we still see companies trying to run their IT shops and IT departments for the IT of today with the IT ideas which we developed 50 years ago. And then you say, no, oh, no, we are agile, but uh, sorry. Most agile transitions is uh, well, how to put that friendly? It's cargo cults in the best place. I mean, Scrum took over after we started with XP, then Scrum took over. Scrum has a lot of gaps, and what do people, when they have gaps, they fill it with the, with the things they know. And so we have some Scrumish like, waterfallish process, basically, in the end, which is, yeah, well, doing the same thing with t cool new names. And the managers can then say, yeah, but we are agile. Yeah, fine, okay, but still, same ideas. And if you look at this one, the market changed mostly at the same time when this curve went up in IT. So the companies we're trying to support up here today with their problems, the business departments that they face, the kind of markets they have to survive in are very different from the problems we had back here. So if we talk about the role of IT today, basically IT today is, I see four parts of it. It's first of all is the nervous system of the business. We talked about that. And then enabler of disruptive new business models. Um, let's come back to the mobile idea for a moment. What I mean with that is, um, think about mobile in terms of options for business models, for business offerings. The customer no longer needs to go to the internet. The internet walks with the customer. Unfortunately, most companies haven't understood that yet. So, yeah, let's have a little bit of responsive design where we give the web UI in a worse way on your mobile phone. No. Think about that from a product developer, from a product designer point of view. It's an order of magnitude of more options, how you can access your customers and what you can, what kind of value you can deliver to them. Different story. So that's also the, the next one. We haven't talked about cloud native data and all that stuff, which is around there. And um, integral part of the, um, of the business model, that's digital transformation. Um, I mean, IT is everywhere, uh, meanwhile, in the communication with the customer. And if we think about things like API-driven business, so if we talk about companies like Stripe or something like that, where the whole 
business offering is just IT and nothing else anymore. So, well. And then, yeah, if we want to have feedback from the customers, um, quite, we use our systems. We collect feedback, metrics, and so on, or use the social channels and all these kind of things. These are roles these day. Okay. So much for background, but what can we learn from that? First, we live in an age of uncertainty. So, in these kind of markets, with this kind of IT, we do not know anymore what is going to work and not. We have to figure it out. And if we have to figure it out, system theory and empirical reasoning tells us Moving fast, learn all the time to succeed. So this PDCA or PDSA or inspect and adapt or build, measure, learn or however you call that. So you have an idea, you try out if it makes sense. If the market gives you positive response, you reinforce it. Otherwise, you better pivot from that or simply completely drop it or whatever. Because that's the only way how to deal with uncertainty. IT in that game is a critical success factor because we are involved everywhere, so we must not slow down the business evol evolution and even give the new ways to do things. Unfortunately, the best practices we have learned over the last, last 50 years or something like that are a little bit counterproductive because they solve a completely different problem. I mean, the, the practices are not bad per se. They're just slow solving a different problem. It doesn't help anymore, which means we are well. Let's rethink IT. To be honest, yeah, we can't rethink IT in just 45 minutes. So I'm trying to do that for about six or seven years now and moving on. The fun thing is when I started to talk about that, all these managers and business people, oh, yeah, it's, it's cool, it's cool. And they, they were still smiling and laughing. Yeah, it's, it's a nice idea, but world's different. Then about four years ago, the smile went away. And then about two years ago, um, there was a little bit of panic before they entered the room and so on. And yeah, meanwhile, most of the people, uh, so if I'm talking to, especially to higher level managers and so on, saying, yeah, well, unfortunately you were right. We have a problem right now and we have no idea how to get out of that. Okay. But I give you a few ideas about that. So if I try to rethink IT, uh, I, I, let's to take three levels, starting with change drivers, then with the goals, and then going down to the building blocks, and then trying to create a picture from that. So change drivers, we talked about most of them already. So post-industrial markets, yeah, we talked about that. High pressure, highly dynamic markets, driven by uncertainty, because we do not know what of our ideas will be successful or not. Digital transformation, we also talked about that. So API-driven business uh, models or integral part of the um, product, so how we contact or address our customers and so on. And if we would walk, uh, go on with ubiquitous computing, so IT being everywhere but becoming invisible, so smart environments. Uh, they're not smart actually, but IT in the environment and so on, or take the ideas of contextual computing, take this to the next level, so at the moment our devices change their capabilities wherever we are. It, it's still not implemented very well. So um, our smartphone has different capabilities if we are back at home or in the car or at, in the office and so on. And then in the second level combined with ubiquitous computing, um, then our environment changes its behavior depending on who is there. I mean, um, Amazon's Alexa starts that with recognizing voice profiles and then so different voices and then having different capabilities profiles behind that and so on. But that's just a tiny beginning and you now think it through. Again, be a thing in terms of business options that you have. So there's a lot of stuff and we have no idea how the customers will respond to that uncertainty, of course. So but we have to respond to that as IT. And then the disruptive technologies like mobile cloud, smart data, IoT, blah, 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 blah. All that things that we have there where we have to figure out how to do that. 
I have so many customers who have no idea how to work with cloud or smart data or IoT or serverless and all that stuff. I mean, the managers are always talking about AI, but they have no idea what AI is and what they can do with that, what they can't, or what they should and what they shouldn't, and so on. And so we have to learn it ourselves. And if we go to the business departments, they have no idea that it's even there. So we have also have um, helped them to pick it up. Okay, this drives our change. So what are your goals then? How can we go there? First thing is, yeah, what did Kevin say this morning? Not actually speed, velocity. Yeah, pick that up. So the idea of minimizing the cycle times through the IT value chain, right? we have no idea how customers will respond to our ideas. So the faster we can get feedback, the faster we figure out if we do something useful, which creates value, or if we create, do something useless, which in the best case does not create any value, and in the worst case even destroys value. So for the customers and therefore also for ourselves. On the same side, on the same side we need to have a lot of flexibility. I mean, the only thing we are certain about is that the requirements of yesterday are probably outdated today. So we will learn every single day and we have to be able to adapt to that, our IT. Effectiveness, very important. I'd already talked about value or outcome. So focus on outcome, not on output. I mean, it's great if you are a scrum agile development team who has a burn down like hell and lots of velocity and so on. And in a heroic act, you sprinted like hell and created 500,000 lines of code is just six months, and they roll it out, but your customers do not like it. Output, wow. Outcome, null. Maybe you can go to your existing code base and find that one if statement, the condition, well, that doesn't work so well in the given business context. Let's change it a little bit. And all of a sudden, all your customers like the system a lot more because now it behaves like they expect it to behave. Output, almost null, unmeasurable. Outcome, created value, wow. It's, these things are no longer connected to each other. That's this idea. Um, most people are still measuring output because they're coming from this certainty idea. Whatever I create will create value out there. It's certain, that's this industrial assumption still in the head of the people. But it no longer exists. We do not know it anymore. So measuring output doesn't make any sense anymore. Efficiency, we have a lot of questions. So it's, we must be able not to do one experiment at a time, but several of those. On the same side, while going fast, not compromising quality, so highly available, yet adaptable solutions. By the way, this is terribly hard. And yeah, would be a whole session on its own. And of course, continues to improve. These are the new goals for IT of tomorrow. And how can we go there? So there are several ways of achieving that. And there's not this one way, uh, tons of way as long as we try to deliver to these goals. But I, I just put a few ideas in here, and we organize that afterwards a little bit more. So let's start on the process side. Ideas like DevOps help us a lot, and continuous design. I mean, it's cool if we have a very fast IT deliver, uh, value chain and can deliver it very fast, but if we just put crap into that chain, I mean, crap in, crap out. And so continuous design is some concept which helps you to really just put that into the funnel which has a good likelihood to be useful in some way. For going fast, also going down on the batch size to, uh, to batch size one, so a flow-based principle. And the original ideas of Agile, Lean, and so on, we, we will talk about that in a minute, a bit more. On an organizational level, um, also DevOps helps us to come to what I call market capability teams. So teams that are focused on addressing the market as a certain 
set of use cases of interactions with the market, with your customers or your supplier, or whatever, whomever you're working with, and holistically working for this part, having all the skills in there that you need to answer the questions for the changing demands of the market. And with that come ideas of autonomy, purpose, decentralization, blah, blah, and, and all that ideas, which affects your organization a lot. On the technology level, yeah, we have a lot of things in there, cloud native, serverless. By the way, with serverless, I don't mean function as a service, I mean managed services. Function as a service, at least at the moment, for me, is more like a universal integration layer on top of managed services, which is would be also a long story to explain that. Um, maybe in five years or something like that, function as a service is really good enough to replace something like actual services and so on. Um, we'll see how it's going to involve. I'm not sure yet. But it's about managed services, actively reducing vertical integration depth, which helps you to go faster. But also a very different paradigm. It's not only going for, yeah, let's take this open source solution because it's cheaper. Um, no, it, it's a new wave of make or buy, which is a very different story, by the way. And most of the time, um, but that is also out of scope here, um, open source quite often is more expensive in these scenarios than going for a managed service. We can discuss that at the beer later on. And of course, automation resilience and to have that work. And, blah, blah, blah. and, also, and then, yeah, uh, ah, there are people involved. Yeah, we love to forget about people. Oh, it's so bad. I mean, it, whenever somebody talks about change, they say, yeah, the processes and the organization and maybe the tooling and so on. And most of the time, they start try to, uh, to buy tools um, for not touching organizational processes and hope that everything will be solved magically. Yeah, we have Jira right now. Everything is fine. Well, people, they have to work with each other. They have to collaborate different skill sets. And with different skill sets, I don't say, I don't mean front-end developer and back-end developer. I really mean different skill sets. So business department, operations, development, QA, marketing, finance, and so on. And if you don't know what these people are doing and why they're doing it, it's very hard to really collaborate. So you need these ideas of empathy and T-shapedness. You must be willing to take over responsibility, um, which is, by the way, a hard discussion, curiosity mastery. We, we come back to that in a minute. Controlling your whole IT development process, so governance. Managers love that term, governance. It sounds really cool. I'm not sure. I, I don't like it so much, but well. And, the good thing is, so going for outcome-driven, decentralized um, concepts, it's already described, it's there, it's called Beyond Budgeting, or the fork of it, which is called Better Codex. And um, this is also 20 years old, so you can go to the internet, you can browse it, you find everything. So it's, it's a sort of agile for managers, basically. And all, everything you need to know is already defined in there, and it's already proven. There are companies running like that, and it works, even companies with 100,000 employees. So it doesn't only work with 10 people. Okay. And continuous improvement. Yeah, sure. So these are some of the building blocks. Now, DevOps is quite often on that slide. And what's actually the role of DevOps in here? Again. DevOps, three ways of DevOps. And I think DevOps is basically kind of a change catalyst in this whole process. And if you just think now, what the heck do you mean with that? I will try to explain that. So you say, yeah, we want to go DevOps. DevOps. Yeah. It, you see the picture will become a little bit bigger. <laughs> and then you say, yeah, trying to get faster through the value chain and so on, but the problem is our IT organization is too slow, so we need to organize differently. So we have this division of labor organization and it doesn't work too well. So we need a different way to organize. So we come to these market capability teams. So organized against 
these different capabilities of the market, that they immediately respond to needs of demands of the market because this is a lot faster than just having 10 departments needing to work together until they can get out a single response to the market or try out a single new idea because you all need to know how long it takes and how much cross-coordination, how much meeting rooms you need and all that stuff. So, and maybe also going with these platform teams in the background, if you figure out, oh, all these teams are doing the same things again, over and over again, and be careful if you try to implement that, not to go, um, so I call that DevOps 2.0, um, not going for ops um, 0 0.5, which is you have then this so-called platform team, which says, here's the tech stack you have to use, and by the way, you're responsible for running it. The, these market capabilities or product teams. And then the people from the product teams then say, let us count the middle fingers that we have to show you. And they're completely right. It doesn't work that way. It's, it's like creating higher level offerings. So you have this kind of problems. Okay, let's collect them and figure out, yeah, in, we put them together and we created something in a self-service way which you can use, which might solve your problem. Do you like it or do you don't you like it? Yeah, well, and then you have the same thing in an internal market going on, like these teams are working against the external market. That's platform teams, by the way. And, but that's not everything. It's nice, but how can we support them to become even faster? And because it's about cycle times or lead times in Kanban terminology, which leads you to the idea of Autonomy, I mean, nothing against hierarchy. I don't care too much, but hierarchy makes you slow. So you have to make a decision. Market has a new demand, so I have to make a decision. So let's put that, uh, but decisions are made in the hierarchy. So put it to the manager, oh, it doesn't want to decide. So it goes up and up and up. It takes, of course, time until all the managers read that. And then eventually some manager high up, up there says, why the heck are you asking me that? So decide yourself, it goes back down, then you create a committee because nobody wants to have, be guilty if something goes wrong and so on, and you're slow. So putting all the decision authority into the team, they must have the responsibility. So they must have the competencies and the authority, including the responsibility, which is, by the way, a very drastic thing, but you need that or going fast. That's what autonomy is about here. Mm, but still, management says, yeah, well, we still need to manage them because we had a lot of teams and somehow they have to work together towards a common goal. And just telling them what to do doesn't work anymore because we have this autonomy thing in place. And so they come up with this control via purpose, which is more like, um, here is where we want to go, our vision, our goals, and here are a few set of constraints, compliance, and so on, which we can't cross these boundaries, and everything else is your own. It's a very different way of controlling people, so control in a positive way, by the way. Hmm. But still, okay, we gave them these ideas and vision, but we still don't know if they really understood that, so we need that feedback cycle. So controlling and traditional way, so completing the feedback cycle, figuring out of if everybody's on the right track and everybody understood the things right. So how can we do that? Um, I mean, the output-driven controlling doesn't work anymore because we know it doesn't figure out if it, it makes sense or not. So we have to change to an outcome-driven controlling, basically, which is um, the good part of the story is with putting metrics into software, we can do a good part of it. So figuring out, do the customers really like this new idea or not? So A-B testing all these ideas, we know how to do that. But then sitting there, hmm, yeah, we have, uh, but now the rest of our traditional governance model is also already broken. So let's rethink that also. So it's, I mean, we went for autonomy and this control, this indirect control and outcome. And so, yeah, well, so we can throw away the rest of the old traditional governance model anyway and come up with a new one. And then we end up with beyond budgeting or better codex and all these ideas. Good thing. Now, managers are perfectly confused and unhappy. 
So we solved this part of the puzzle. Let's move on to technology. Right. Question is, how can we support this whole autonomy idea on a technological level? Which brings us to the ideas of cloud native and especially microservice. I mean, the original idea of microservices is, we first we took care about the hierarchy communication, which makes us slow, but also lateral communication makes us slow. And we have 10 teams working in a big monolith, and you know the definition of a monolith, if you change something in the upper right, something in the lower left falls down usually. Um, you have to agree all the time, coordinate and so on, if you want to change something. And this makes you slow again. And so let's try to make sure that the technical artifacts don't cross team boundaries and also that the teams can deploy independently. So if they want to, that they can move on their own pace, that's what microservices are about. That's it. So, well, uh, many people pick that up without having all the other things in place, but, well, yeah, well, then you have the problems of a distributed system without getting any benefits, but it feels cool. Well, if you're happy. So, um, by the way, I love microservices, but um, it's an architectural style which isn't an answer for every situation. In certain situations it helps you in other places because distributed systems are hard and what you create with Microsoft is a distributed system. A monolith is a lot easier to understand from its runtime behavior. It sucks quite often because people lack the discipline to organize it internally in a good way. But if you're not able to organize a monolith in a good way internally, how do you think that you're able to organize your microservice in a good way? Well, you just create a distributed ball of mud or distributed monoliths, so the worst of both worlds, but yeah, okay. But let's assume you're smart people, you're doing it right. And we have these microservices, and then, but still, we want to go faster. Can we help them even more? Which brings us to the idea of heterogeneity. Oh, wow, chaos will break out. No, chaos will not break out. So these teams are responsible for solving a problem on the business domain, out capability and so on. They will just pick the technology that helps them to get the task done. And uh, by the way, with the platform teams, you still can cheat a little bit. That's what Netflix, for instance, did, saying, yeah, well, we support a lot of libraries on the Java level, so that they're not, and if a team goes for Python, they have a good reason for that, because they don't have the support from the Java libraries anymore. But still, it's their decision, they're responsible, and um, it won't be a problem. I mean, if you take away autonomy and purpose from a developer and saying just do stuff, at least they want to create some kind of mastery, and which is, yeah, let's check out new technology. As soon as you give smart people autonomy and purpose, they will act differently. So feedback loop was simply broken. And so that's no problem. So everybody takes whatever they need to get the job done. Still, yeah, on the, it's nice if you have that on that level, but on the platform level, I mean, I had projects where before even the re I started gathering requirements, I went out and had to um, order the test servers because it took six months to get them. And yeah, sure, we know how that's solved these days. Cloud, serverless, managed services, all that stuff for being fast on the infrastructure level. And then the next question comes up, yeah, high speed and high quality delivery because we want to release often. Yeah, sure, continuous delivery. And high availability in production because we don't have just a few monoliths anymore, but we have a lot of services running on machines and we don't even know where it's running and so on and not high availability hardware, which brings us to resilient software design and hopefully a little bit of chaos engineering to, uh, to un uh, discover the unknown unknowns in production. So I'm figuring that out. And how can we reliably manage all these things? Again, many services running on hardware somewhere. We have no idea when which node they're actually running which brings us to automation and observability. 
And okay, technology is soft, but how can we make sure that these teams are working smoothly together? So at least the the artifacts work smoothly together because in the end these services has to have to call each other at least once in a while, probably. And so that we have some kind of rule. And that's what I mean with this lean enterprise architecture management. Uh, the basic, the original idea of enterprise architecture management is broken basically because it assumes certainty. So if you want to create a building map or something like that, it assumes that your business is not going to move very fast and so on. And if it does well, then what do these strategic pictures help you? But how to organize between those teams and figure out, um, so I have some kind of identity and access management problems. How do we work with that? Are we going to use um, um, something like OAuth 2 with JSON Web Tokens, or do we something use something different, and so on? So all these things, and usually you don't want to have some kind of a group of people whose qualification is not having touched a keyboard for seven years or something like that. But you want to have best you have some advocates from the different from the different product teams, which is the best idea to get as few things as possible in place, which makes sure that all the things interact smoothly. Okay, sustainability. Yeah, continuous improvement. We had that. How do we get the input for that? We need quick feedback loops, fast. Yeah. Well, uh, how do we establish that one? Batch size zero, I said, no, one, sorry. Flow-based approaches. I mean, projects have fixed costs and which means that you put lots of things in there, which gives you very few, um, very rare feedback. So every six or nine months, you get one data point. Customer liked it, not. You want to be faster. Ideally, every single day, you want to have feedback. And, ah. Uh, I forgot about the people again. Done. Yeah. Of course, mastery. I mean, you don't do that just by being utilized till the last minute. So you have to be able to learn the things, to improve continuously, go into a conference, have a Dev Friday, have 20% time, whatever. The concepts are well known, basically. And by the way, it's not... Um, an accident, accidental in that mastery, autonomy, and purpose are on the same slide. Oops, what happened here? It doesn't like me. Ah, yes, it likes me. Hello. Ah, okay, I know what's going on. Also, we need, um, need to have the T-shapedness. We talked about that before. Um, things like apprenticeship and so on in your company can help you a lot with that. And last thing we need is curiosity because things change all the time. We have to discover new ways all the time. Um, would be a session completely on its own, but um, just saying that if the first thing, if something goes wrong is you're looking for the guilty person it takes half an hour and everything is killed and you can't forget about the whole rest of that. Okay, that's a big picture. You see, it started with DevOps, basically. And so, and it's not complete. There are more things and you could also draw more arrows and so on, but it's confusing enough like it is. But what can we learn from that? Quite straightforward. All the things I showed you are interrelated. So a single topic has quite limited effect. It's, it's good doing that, but it has a little... It's, it's, what's it? the, the effect actually multiply up. The more you do, the bigger the effect becomes. And the driver for all that is DevOps. So in the core. Before I wrap up, a little warning. Because there's so much dogmatism around these days. This is a model. This is a model for reasoning, for thinking about things, for coming to new ideas. It's an idea, it's not a dogma. Whenever you go back to your company, 
reality will be more complex. There will be a lot of shades of gray in there, and that's okay. But still, this model helps you to think about things and find your true north. Say, yeah, well, and then adapt it a little bit to your reality. And if you're starting to implement something like that, please, it's a revolution in your head. You really think differently about it, but it's an evolution in implementation. If you try to implement everything at the same time, your company will come to a screeching halt and nothing will work anymore. So continuous improvement process, that's the idea. Even if the effects multiply up, but you have to start somewhere and you have to accept for a while that, yeah, the effect won't be that big and then bigger, 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 bigger. Okay, with this word of warning, let's wrap up. We talked about market has changed, IT has changed, and the role of IT has changed, which makes us rethinking IT, which basically gives us new drivers, which gave us new goals and new building blocks, how to implement all that. We know all the building blocks, but we have to connect them in the right way. And a good starting point for all that, from my experience, is DevOps, because it always drives you in the right direction. How can I get faster? How can I get more feedback, faster feedback? How can I create value from, does it deliver value what you're just doing or not? And this is what DevOps is always asking you if you're doing it right. Quite some books to read for that, and creating some foundations. And that's what I had for you. And I'm sorry I'm just one minute late right now. Always the same. Sorry about that, but thanks for your patience so far. <laughs>